I am Stacey Comfort. I am the team librarian here at Chelsea District Library. And we have brought artist Lisa DeJoy Nutini and uh, archaeologist Manuel, did I say that correctly? Yes, uh, from uh, Pennsylvania to talk to us about a fund us. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Stacy. And um, I, I don't, I don't see Stacy over there, but um, um, be sure that I'm mindful of your presence there. Um, thank you for for having us. Um, the way we, uh, Lisa and I, um, um, decided we would run this is uh, I'll do a bit of an introduction, sort of a general over. Um, uh, overview of Dia de los Muertos, maybe make a connection or two here with, with uh, Frida's garden. And then, and then Lisa will take us in the present and connect us ever more uh, solidly to the, to the theme. So um, just so you know, my name is Manuel Roman Nacayo. I am the Associate Director for the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, as, as Stacy said, I am an archaeologist uh, by, by training and studies, uh, although I am mostly working in broader themes now that I, I work at the Center for Latin American Studies at Pitt. And I want to share with you my um, little, um, my presentation just because, especially because I, I like the colors a lot. So, um, Hopefully you can see this uh, well enough. And there we go. Um, and so what, um, what I wanted to share with you um, in, in terms of um, this whole idea about Dia de los Muertos and that connection that is so strong uh, in terms of Mexico in particular, uh, the way they celebrate it. Uh, which is obviously, uh, and, and perhaps as you know, um, uh, not the only way that the Day of the Dead is celebrated around the world, but especially in Latin America. So I want to contrast a little bit of that as well. And, 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 and though we will focus on the Mexican aspect, I will also share with you some, uh, a bit of an experience for, for, for the, the, the value of contrast. Um, uh, from when I spent three years living in Guatemala, um, uh, I, I went there for work and I was fortunate enough to see uh, that beautiful country. And it always brought to mind, having grown up in Nicaragua myself, how different their celebrations were. And, you know, you may already know this, but it bears saying that Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, in, uh, in the Mexican tradition, is not so much a day of mourning as it tended to be a, where I grew up in Nicaragua. Day of the Dead is, is the sad sort of, in, in some ways, reliving the sadness of the loss of the person who is no longer there. Where in Mexico, it tends to be more of a, a celebration of the life uh, those people who are no longer among us led and sort of the, the memories and the shared experiences that we the living had with those people who are no longer among us. And I should also say not losing sight of the fact that we are in the times that we are uh, having so much loss um, and, and so much loss of life, uh, especially in the last couple of years. Um, it might be um, worth thinking about ways that people elsewhere think about death uh, and how they face it differently than we might. Um, in general, and as I said, where I, where I grew up, um, death is not seen as a as a great cause for celebration or joy. Uh, it's not that it is really in most places, but uh, the remembrance of those people who have um, left this, uh, this world are, you know, tinged with either joy or sadness to different degrees. And in the Mexican tradition, you know, it, it is thought that 
it comes from uh, this long line of uh, Mesoamerican, generally Mesoamerican, uh, meaning the north of Central America all the way through most of what is Mexico today, uh, a, a, a worldview where, you know, people dying was not necessarily, uh, it, it, it was a time of adjustment for the living, but also the question about what happens to them, what happens to those souls. And of course, when the Spanish came um, in the 16th century to the American continent, well, uh, the late 15th and er uh, early 16th, when they came, the Spanish came to the American continent, uh, they had a Catholic tradition that they brought and they were able to, in many ways, leverage for uh, making, for conquering uh, this, this territory, this whole continent from, you know, Alaska to, to essentially Tierra del Fuego. And the Catholic tradition um, was in some ways brought together in what is called syncretism. Um, commonly understood as a way of uniting elements that are similar, uh, but that really pervade a, in this case, a dominant um, uh, worldview, which is what the Spanish brought. Their, their perspective of, and the, the way they thought of the indigenous people that, that lived all over this American continent um, was uh, of people who were not uh, at the same level of understanding of the world that they were. And, and with that came the imposition of their religion. Uh, and by all um, accounts, I mean, the Catholic religion was the first one that was brought in from Europe. Um, then of course, it was also right around the time of uh, uh, movements in the, in, the Christian, uh, in, in the Christian tradition, the church where Protestant um, then it just, you know, later emerged. And that's um, mostly what um, pervaded upon the arrival of other colonists, uh, mostly from other parts of Europe, um, England uh, or Britain, largely uh, Germany, Holland, uh, or the Netherlands, uh, into this part of in North America and the northern part of the American continent. So the, the, the tradition does at least in the Mexican um, uh, version has, has this this uh, connection to indigenous uh, ways of seeing death, and it is celebrated nowadays as a way of celebrating the lives of the people who are you know who have gone before us. Let's say uh, in in terms of what that that person's life or those people's lives mean to us, how they impact us, the legacy that they've left before, uh, for us. Um, you may know, um, it basically there are these three days that are from the 31st of October to the 2nd of November that are couched in this Roman Catholic um, custom. Right, where it is the day before the All Souls Day, uh, which is uh, the Hallow's Eve, which here is celebrated as Halloween. Uh, All Souls Day, the day of, uh, that we celebrate these souls, and All Saints Day, the next day. Um, so contrary to a lot of confusion, because once again, we're sort of mixing things, mixing traditions, right? Where Halloween has been very strong, um, uh, uh, so, you know, a very uh, important celebration, let's say, if nothing else for the joy of wearing costumes and eating a lot of candy. Um, it's, it's been around those days, that's been the, the primary celebration in the U.S. especially. But the next two days, which are not celebrated here, are the ones that are more important in the rest of the American continent. And it has to do more with it, it. They're not the Halloween of Latin America. They are actually totally different celebrations that if you look back at the pagan and the uh, Catholic tradition, they are connected, but they're very different. 
So, um, the, you know, what's celebrated in the Aztec, and actually even before, as I said, Mesoamerican, even before is, is really this, uh, this passage um, of, you know, from one state of the living of this dimension, of this world, however you understand our existence, to another one that we on this side don't have necessarily access to, and that we may, and that we probably will end up in. And, and that right there might even remind you, of course, of, of this idea of the living and then uh, ideas of purgatory and heaven and, 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 and hell, right? Um, you know, these passages, uh, where do we go once we are no longer, once our bodies are no longer hosting our souls, where, once we're no longer alive? Among the Aztecs, there were basically four. You, you could end up in four different places. And it depended on your condition, your age, uh, sort of your occupation, where, you know, if, if you drowned or if uh, it rains, um, you know, if, if a river took you, uh, if you had some sort of water mishap and you perished, you ended up in Tlalocan. Tlaloc is the god of rain in, in the Aztec. Um, uh, at least the late Aztec um, customs. Then uh, there's another place that you could end up, which is Omeyokan, which is a place uh, where if you were a warrior, a soldier that, that died, um, that's where you end up. So there's like a, if you can imagine a place for the people who died because of water issues, a place for people who died because they were soldiers or fought in wars, and then there's Miklan, which is the place where most people end up, which when they die of natural causes. And it's not the easiest place to be at uh, because it takes you a while to get through and finally make it there. And if you saw that movie Coco, which is very famous and has uh, popularized the whole idea of Day of the Dead among us, um, in, especially in this part of the world, there's a little dog that, um, that accompanies he seems to be around helping Coco uh, make it through this this place uh, but basically it's uh, you're guided it's your it, this this dog is guiding uh, Co uh, the, the boy all the way through right where in fact um, there is a mythology that involves a dog guiding you through this tortuous four-year journey to actually make it to the plan. So if you're just a regular person who dies of natural causes, you go through this. Um, and then there's this place, uh, and I, I will try, I attempt to uh, pronounce it again, Chichi uh, Wakwako, and that's where the children, when, when children die, that's where they end up. So there's these four different places, right, that they saw our souls or their souls, uh, their dear, uh, dearly departed, ending up in. And over time, you know, when the Spanish came, as I said before, uh, and they um, promoted uh, very strongly forced in, in some ways, the Catholic religion upon uh, the local populations, the Aztecs had to accommodate their, their sort of worldview. And so did the Spanish to make their practices uh, take root, right? Um, so it's, it, it was that. And as I said before, there are other ways in Latin America that we see um, uh, death and these passages. And for example, in Guatemala, where I was fortunate enough to live for three years, um, uh, about 10 years ago, I was able to witness uh, this festival of the kites that takes place in a couple of places, only in a couple of places in the, in the plains, uh, in the high plains in, in Guatemala. And the idea is that kites, and if you, uh, I don't know how well you can see the, the pictures that I've, I'm trying to share, but these kites are very large. And the ones that you see here that are, they might be um, 30, 50 feet sometimes, those actually do not fly, but they do have some very large ones that are not quite the largest that do. And they require 
an incredible effort. It's not just one or two or three people. It's like 30 people holding on for dear life before this kite takes them. And the idea with the kites is that the kites go up into the heavens and through this string allow you to connect, allow the people who are here on this earth to connect with the souls who went before us. Uh, and I just thought that that was, that's amazing. Um, it's, it's a completely different celebration, but it also is a way of actually connecting with um, our dearly departed. Another thing that they do in Guatemala, um, besides the, uh, the kites, is this, this, this is traditional food, fiambre. It's, it, you can imagine it's like cold cuts. It's like an antipasto. It's stuff that you can take with you that doesn't, uh, pair, or that doesn't go bad very easily. It's pickled um, vegetables and, um, and eggs and, and uh, cold cuts and, you know, I thought I'd imagine all, the, all, all, all of that stuff put together. And then people go and eat it at the cemetery with the uh, tombstones of their, uh, uh, of their relatives and the people they, they remember. Um, of course, some of this also takes place in celebrations at, in homes, and I was able to partake in that part when, I, when, when uh, uh, friends invited me over. And it, it, it's really a very neat um, contrast, as I said, as to how I grew up. Thinking of the Day of the Dead was this, this sort of very um, somewhat dreadful, honestly, <laughs> um, you know, remembrance of the people who are who you who you care for and who are no longer with you. Um, so, you know, there there are other ways throughout Latin America that people celebrate it. And so, where I'm going to connect uh, this is is that you know, as, as you think about it in the framework of of um, of, of Frida uh, Kahlo's life and how what she expressed through her art and through her life and her experience and energy. You know, it, it, what you see, the evidence that is all around, that's left behind by her, um, not only in chronicles and people who knew her, who, who wrote stories, and of course you may have seen the movies that, that relate or maybe even documentaries about her life and how difficult uh, some of that uh, was and, and all the barriers she broke, etc. She is in some ways, uh, not in some ways, I mean, she is totally a product of, of this, this view of the world um, that she grew up and she lived around uh, essentially all of her life in Mexico. And, and it's this idea of how, you know, you, you, the world is never um, you know, our beliefs, our culture, our practices are never the same year to year. They, they, they change, they uh, adapt, their, they serve a purpose for us in our lives, right? They, they mean something and they bring meaning to the things that we do. And they change constantly. And, and, and I see in some ways this, this the dynamics of syncretism which are really, you know, they seem like a moment that's frozen in time, the Spanish came with their Catholic religion, the indigenous people were there, they figured out something, Catholic religion, religion remained, and then there were all these sort of uh, indigenous practices that were woven through, but, but truly, that's not it. That's not the last moment that happened. It keeps on happening over, over time. And um, with that, um, what I wanted to, uh, to, to share uh, in, in that respect is, is how the Day of the Dead um, is not just this celebration, this moment in time, it keeps on evolving. And, um, you know, I, it keeps on serving a purpose and that's why it remains. That's why it's a tradition that, that, that remains, but it also, changes and adapts to this role, then, you know, proof of this is that here we are talking on Zoom uh, about the other <laughs> dead, which uh, is something that might not have happened uh, three years ago or even two years ago uh, at, this, uh, at this very day. But um, also, 
Um, I want to take a moment to introduce and, and connect you with, with Lisa Giorgettini, who's a friend and whom I've had the pleasure of um, uh, making presentations on Day of the Dead um, uh, before, and who will tell you a heck of a lot more about the actual practice and who will likely be a lot better at, at connecting it to this, this whole, um, uh, the idea and the, and the person and the art that, that Frida Kahlo left us. So I'm gonna turn my screen off so I don't distract and I'm, I'll hand it off to Lisa. Oh, thank you, Manuel. Uh, very kind and generous <laughs> observations. Um, I'm Lisa, I am, a dealer of Mexican folk art. And I came to that vocation through my late husband, whose mother was from Mexico City, his stepmother also Mexicana, and his father was Chilean, but studied Mexican cultural anthropology. And so when uh, he, we met and he took me to Mexico for the first time and we did some shopping. Uh, that was that. I, I was just in love with, well, I was in love with Mexico before I even landed from the plane, just the view of the volcanoes from the plane. And I was in tears. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, came to the interest in Dia de los Muertos with um, a trip we made to Oaxaca on the Days of the Dead. And um, that began my obsession with ofrendas because if you want to see where it's really done in a big, big way, uh, that's one of the places that you have to add to your to-go to list. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and start the um, my presentation. And um, apologies for my slowness. Okay. Somebody tell me what to press again, I forget. Uh, up to the top slideshow. Thank you. And then that should give you the controls to start, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> when I get nervous, it all goes out of my head. <laughs> I know. So, um, Manuel went through quite a bit already of uh, some of the history and uh, but I use this phrase because um, I had a store for 13 years, a physical store, and people would come in and they'd say, what's up with all those skeletons? And, you know, there's no quick answer to that, obviously, um, but I would always try my best to educate them. Um, and so, um, as, as Manuel was explaining, we have this um, very um, blended celebration. And I'm sorry, I'm moving this around. Can you see this here? Can you see that I'm moving the gallery around? Or do you have a an unobstructed view? And, and in any case, um, so we have the, the complexity of roots in, in European cultures, the Celtics, the Spaniards, but in fact, in the time of the conquest, what, what was discovered was uh, through artifacts found in various archeological sites that there were all of these skeleton images in the the relics found the and the um, and in the temples and with burials. And you'll see here I'm showing you some examples of masks, 
Um, and the one on the upper right in particular is interesting because they call this the three phases of life. Um, and some people interpret that as, as birth um, our, our life after birth and our life after death. Um, and then you also have a lot of imagery um, from the archeological sites that talks about finding traces of Kopal, um, this very sacred resinous um, incense uh, that comes from the Kopal tree that was burned to honor the gods. They called it food for the gods. They had traces of what today we know as Paco Picado, um, but as in the uh, some other cultures, they're, they're prayer flags. They, um, much like the kites, they transmit a message on the winds. And so this was the first evidence they had that um, Day of the Dead was a month-long festival dedicated to the god and goddess of the underworld in Miklan, um, who presided over the dead, and that um, uh, on hearing that, the, the priests, who were everywhere the conquistadors were, uh, felt that was too pagan for their, their tastes. And... Um, I'm sure they also saw the similarity between the the Celtic uh, commemorations as well. But I also want to mention the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And here again, we see uh, an in-between world that one must traverse to get from one place to part of heaven to another or from hell to heaven. So, as they say in all legends, there there are elements of truth. Um, but what the the upshot of it all was, as a way of attempting to to conquer the indigenous, they convinced them that instead of a month long festival. We're going to condense it into All Saints Day and All Souls Day. And um, they pretended to uh, go along with that, to agree with that, but they never completely relinquished their original beliefs. And to this day, we see that, that it's all this, this complicated blending of beliefs and cultures. And that that presupposes a, a belief, as Manuel was saying, it, we have to go right to that point of, of do, asking these questions of ourselves. What do we think happens when we die? Where do the people we love to die, where have they gone? Can we still communicate with them? And so on and so forth. So it always brings up interesting conversations um, that don't necessarily have any clear conclusions. And people tend to, to hold on to what suits them. And that suits me just fine as well. Um, I want to talk about the, the monarch butterflies and why we see so much of their imagery related to Dia de los Muertos. It's because in their wintering grounds in Michoacan, they tend to arrive right on or near the Day of the Dead. And so there was always this supposition that they are the souls returning to be with us on those days. And here again, in many cultures, people see butterflies as visitors. Um, our dead visiting us for a quick hello, just letting us know they're thinking of us and bringing us some cheer. 
So in my offerings, you'll notice a lot of the butterfly imagery. And um, I just wanted to share these incredible images with you of how they look just as they're waking up. Uh, when they're still sleeping, they're conserving their energy. They lose a lot of their color. And as they awake and start to move, we see their beautiful orange colors come back. So um, as I was saying, we like to think of them as always being, or at least I do, I should speak just for myself. I like to think of my dead family and friends as always being accessible to me via thoughts and prayers. Um, but there can be no mistaking the fact that on these particular days, the, the communication, the boundaries are, are thinner and they are more accessible to us. And so this is why we build ofrendas. We want to light their way home. We want to attract them and let them know we're thinking of them. Here you have some images of the celebration as it's done in Michoacan, in Pascuaro, an island where everyone spends the entire evening in their cemeteries, decorating the graves, bringing the food. And of course, marigolds are the the most important aspect of the decorations. They, the other aspects that we want to include on an ofrenda would be their photograph, their favorite food, their favorite drink. Um, but it could be anything as well. It could be uh, anything that represents your connection to them. And you see a friend is with three levels uh, very often, representing the underworld, the earth, and the heavens. Here I have some examples of ofrendas that I did in my store over the years. And um, obviously I was always wanting to show off the artwork that exemplified the tradition. So it was a little bit of an incorporation between honoring people who had died between the last year's commemoration and the current one. And I had to limit it to that because they got very crowded and I would have events where they, um, my customers came to add things to my ofrendas. So I had to sort of limit the the number of people I was honoring. This was the friend I made on the 50th anniversary of Frida's death in the front of my store window. And um, it remains one of the most favorite out of the many, many ofrendas that I've made. This was one of the ones that I first viewed in Oaxaca that year that I was um, telling you about earlier. And, and there in the city, they have competitions between the businesses uh, to see who makes the most beautiful ofrendas. And when I saw an entire doorway decorated with live miracles, and of course the, the fragrance is just so beautiful. Um, I, I knew I would never be the same. <laughs> so in talking about um, some of the elements, if you want to follow in the tradition, we're looking at colors, first of all, and what they represent. So the black is rep representing Mitlan, the land of the dead, and the pre-Hispanic origins. Purple comes from Catholicism, um, signifying pain and grief, mourning. 
but pink and bright orange indicate our joy at the thought of our reunion with them on these days. White for purity and hope, and yellow and orange for the marigold, the sun, and light. We leave one little uh, bowl of salt representing the, the flavor of life and water in case they're thirsty after their long journey to be with us or long as we imagine it. And the papel picado, the cut paper strands, um, rather than plastic wherever possible, um, represent the brevity of life. You know, they don't last forever. They get ruined as soon as it rains, but this is how life is. And the marigolds um, are known as Sempasucho, which means the flower of 400 lives. And I also mentioned the Copal, which is considered uh, a way to honor our deities and ancestors. Uh, one beautiful, beautiful thing is uh, that you'll see in Mexico are trails of marigold petals, and that's meant to lead them to the altar. Now, we talk about photographs of human beings, but many people also honor their pets. And this was our dog um, the year that he had died. I put his treats, his collar, his photograph. I made a little Nicho uh, using St. Francis, of course, the patron saint of animals, to watch over him. Sugar skulls are an essential. And um, if you don't have access to real ones, now you can make your own. They sell kits, and it's a fun project to do with kids, but it is lengthy, you need several days. Uh, the tradition on, you'll see in the photograph on the right, where you have the foil on the forehead is the bakery where you're buying them will write the name of your beloved dead person in icing on the forehead. The sugar skulls are the most ubiquitous of the art forms as far as just the shape and the style of it. So I'm going to start here to show you um, some of the many forms of folk art that it has inspired. The one on the left is actually done out of felt rather than paper. And on the right, you see an assortment of um, little uh, ceramic We can't leave out an important artist who also has lent the ubiquity of this image to everything you see related to Dia de los Muertos. Jose Guadalupe Posada from Aguas Calientes was a teacher, uh, an illustrator, a printmaker, and he worked for newspapers, among other things, and often wanted to illustrate the Europeans who were occupying Mexico City at that time and sort of um, turning their noses up at the very people whose city they were occupying, trying to make them feel that they were better than them. And so he illustrated people as skeletons, famous people, with one or two recognizable aspects included. And La Catrina, as she's known, the lady with the big hat, um, usually also wore um, a fox stole, carried a purse. Um, she represented things that were resented at the time, but illustrating her as a skeleton kept him out of trouble. And you see this image everywhere. Next time you'll see it, you can tell somebody you know why. 
So um, more folk art, little tiny um, plaster things, and um, the the predominant theme that you'll notice is that people are happy and enjoying their afterlife. This is how we like to think of them. Rather than thinking of them going through trials in Mitlan, we like to think they've gone past that and that they're still enjoying all of the things they enjoyed here, maybe exploring lots of new things as well. This is a painting by a famous family from Mexico City with Frida and La Catrina. And this is ceramic from, um, painted in the style of papella mate, bark taper. Um, this is from the state of Mexico. In Oaxaca, there's a very well-known artist who directs the Museum of Folk Art, Popular Art, named Carlo Manuel Pedro Martinez. And he is known for this very spare, elegant style of Barro Negro, which is the famous black pottery of Oaxaca. He called this one the kiss of death. He's one of my favorites, although it's very hard for me to choose favorites. This is a style of work from Izuka de Matamoras in Puebla, known for the really fine detail. And work from the state of Mexico, Metepec, and from the Aguilar family in Oaxaca. Here you can see La Katrina with her hat and her mink stole and her purse. There's also lots of poking fun at religious figures like this bishop here. And here in the center, we see Frida with the monkey on her shoulder. Another splendid piece from Izucar in the center there. And more. <laughs> I'm not going to go on and on, but if anybody has questions, type them in the chat and we'll, you know, if you want details on any of these pieces. Most of these pieces have been sold, but um, there are others, of course. <laughs> this in particular is a, was a very special one. Uh, it's in my collection. This comes from Michoacan the famous Orta family. This is a combination of lacquered wood. And here again, you see a lot of poking fun at the devil and devil masks are often used to illustrate stories in dances on very particular occasions, saints days, holidays. Um, they're not viewed with the dread that uh, we in North America associate with them, devils or skeletons. We embrace uh, the duality of our existence. Um, and many people think having devil masks around help as a sort of a protection. This is a beautiful tree of life featuring the monarchs. And more, more wonderful things from both Izuka and Oaxaca. One year, my sister-in-law made sugar cookies, sugar skull sugar cookies for one of my big events. And I still marvel at them to this day. You see brides and grooms in little boxes, little nichos. And usually we're talking about Love eternal, amor eternal. I'm partial to the work of my brother-in-law, a great printmaker, and he made this in honor of his grandmother, and it is in his mother's home in Mexico. 
You also see beaded work by the Rachel Indians in this category. This is called Duality by Demetrio Garcia Aguilar of Oaxaca. Here again, more, more poking fun. <laughs> And more. Lots of jewelry in this category, obviously, sterling silver. This was a wonderful Frida out of Papier Miche from the famous Linares family in Mexico City. So here's a step back from a view of a big ofrenda that I did uh, in the store. And as the years progressed, I went away from photographs because I was trying to represent so many dead and I went to a monitor with digital images there. You'll see that fruits um, are an important offering that you want to have on an ofrenda, as well as Panda Muerto, the bread of the dead. I don't know if you can see the two little ones there in front. This was an ofrenda from my late husband. So talking, um, circling back to elements, including things that, that were of great meaning to the person. So he worked on films and in theater productions and I included lots of his, um, badges from jobs and funny toys that he liked, his Mexican toys. Um, he loved the Red Sox, the tools of his trade, a flashlight, a wrench, and a beautiful painting done by one of his best friends. Um, I often made room for people to add notes on the sides of the ofrenda in the shape of butterflies. And the notes that people left were just heartbreakingly beautiful. And I think one of the most important parts when you're talking about making a group of friend as opposed to your own smaller personal one. Uh, a really funny piece of uh, the devil in the confessional with the priest who looks a little exasperated. I have no shortage of artwork images, as you can see. Here's a copal as an offering on the ofrenda and in an image of Tlaloc, who we were discussing earlier, the cloud of rain. Um, last year, I wanted to, of course, honor the people who we lost from COVID. And I just, last year, the number on the day of the dead was 4,900,000. And as you can see, between the fall and now, that number has increased dramatically. Um, but I also recognize people that we've lost due to so many other things. Um, and of course, now we have war once again on our mind. Not that we're, we, war is not always with us, but especially in this week, we are thinking about the losses and um, people who are starving, people who have died violently. Um, there's no end to the people that we honor or we, we want to honor. And so when I make an ofrenda, these are the questions I ask myself. That, you know, I feel it's important to say their names. Um, when I've lost many, many people in my life, friends and family, and the question that always we always come back to is, how am I living now? Am I living my life so that when I'm gone, 
people will want to light a candle for me. Will they remember how much I love them? And again, the, the image that, um, not the image, the idea that we discussed earlier um, about group conversations that are nice to have around these themes. And that is, what do you believe? Do you feel like they are able to communicate with us? Do you try to communicate with them? Now, since the Disneyfication, <laughs> if that's a word, of Dia de los Muertos with the films, um, you have sure have noticed you can go to your CVS and buy inexpensive things made of plastic, made in China, in Target, and anywhere, really. And I'm not saying whether this is good or bad. I'm just asking people to consider um, if they buy something, what it represents, who it was made by, how that might affect the Mexican people who are engaged in this work. Does it take away from them making their living? Does it endanger their artistic traditions. I know not everyone can buy an expensive collector's item. There were certainly many years in my life when I couldn't. And I'd be certainly happy to be able to buy that piece in the drugstore in Target. So I'm not putting judgment on it except to say, I, I like people to do it with consciousness of what it represents and to to have these discussions with other people. Um, and that goes as well to the theme of cultural appropriation. I'm not Mexicana, obviously, except in my heart. Um, and I've made this a part of my life's work. Um, I've talked with many of the artists that I've worked with over the years. I've shown them pictures of my friends, and they seem to really relish the idea that their culture was being disseminated. So I think it's a matter of doing it with respect and with education. And um, as Manuel said, as these things continue to evolve, um, who knows where we're going with this, but I find it personally a very healing practice, especially for people right in the depths of grief and um, that it brings some, some resolution to a, a way to express what you're feeling um, around the, you know, extreme um, pain of missing somebody. Uh, but I, I can't help but saying, please, <laughs> please support Mexican artists whenever you can. Or, or the Mexican culture in any way that you can. Um, but that's just my little corner of it. Um, I think the most important thing is that you do it with love and um, that is about all that I have to say on that, I think. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a sugar skull that I have made with love. So I just want to thank you all for your attention and your time. And um, anybody with a question that might see this later, um, Stacy has uh, my contact info and um, feel free to be in touch. If you have any questions, you can ask her right now or um, email her later. Yeah. Okay, thank you <laughs> for coming. Uh, you know, coming. To... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I will uh, pass your email on uh, if we have anybody with questions. And I will send you the edited video when it's done tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. And also, if you have any quick questions, um, I 
you know, and you're still around and you're still interested and have the time, I'm more than willing to entertain them now as well. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Stacy, And uh, I hope everybody has a, a great evening. Yes. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye Lisa. Bye.